Let's continue with chapter 5. My nagging got the better of Jim eventually, as I knew it would, and to my relief we slowed down the game a while. He still maintained, however, that Atticus hadn't said we couldn't, therefore we could, and if Atticus ever said we couldn't, Jim had thought of a way around it. He would simply change the names of the characters, and then we couldn't be accused of playing anything. Dill was in hearty agreement with this plan of action. Dill was becoming something of a trial anyway, following Jim about. He had asked me earlier in the summer to marry him, and then he promptly forgot about it. So I want to point out here, a lot of my students uh, are like, oh, he, aren't these like children? How are they getting married? So when he says that Dill was going to marry her, that's not real. It means that they're playing house and getting married in that way. Uh, the character of Dill was based on a writer named Truman Capote, who was a friend of Harper Lee's. And also what we know about Truman Capote in his later life, he probably wouldn't have been super interested in Scout anyway. Um, you can make of that what you will. He staked me out, marked me as his property, and said I was the only girl he would ever love. And then he neglected me. I beat him up twice, but it did no good. He only grew closer to Jim. They spent days together in the treehouse, plotting and planning, calling me only when they needed a third party. But I kept aloof from their more foolhardy schemes for a while, and on pain of being called a girl, I spent most of the remaining twilights that summer sitting with Miss Maudie Adkinson on her front porch. So here we have another one of those themes of To Kill a Mockingbird, the idea of gender roles. Uh, the, the idea that boys are supposed to behave this way and girls are supposed to behave this way. And Scout doesn't quite buy into those. Jim and I had already enjoyed the free run of Miss Maudie's yard if we kept out of her azaleas. But our contact with her was not clearly defined. Until Jim and Dill excluded me from their plans, she was only another lady in the neighborhood, but a relatively benign presence. Let's look up our first vocabulary word there. Nine. So gentle and kindly. Our tacit treaty with Miss Maudie was that we could play on her lawn, eat her scuppernongs if we didn't jump on the arbor, and explore her vast back lot, terms so generous we seldom spoke to her, so careful were we to preserve the delicate balance of our relationship. But Jim and Dill drove me closer to her with their behavior. Miss Maudie hated her house. Time spent indoors was time wasted. She was a widow, a chameleon lady who worked in her flower beds in an old straw hat and men's coveralls. But after her five o'clock bath, she would appear on the porch and reign over the street in magisterial beauty. She loved everything that grew on God's earth, even the weeds, with one exception. If she found a blade of nut grass in her yard, it was like the second battle of the Marne. She swooped down upon it with a tin tub and subjected it to blast from beneath with a poisonous substance she said was so powerful it'd kill all of us if we didn't stand out of her way. Why don't you just pull it up? I asked after witnessing a prolonged campaign against a blade not three inches high. Pull it up, child, pull it up. She picked up the limp sprout and squeezed her thumb up its tiny stalk. Microscopic grains oozed out. Why, one sprig of nut grass can ruin a whole yard. Look here. When it comes fall, this dries up and the wind blows it all over Macon County. Miss Maudie's face likened such an occurrence unto an Old Testament pestilence. So let's check out that word, pestilence. There you go, a fatal epidemic disease, especially the bubonic plague. Her speech was crisp for a Macomb County inhabitant. She called us by our names, and when she grinned, she revealed two minute gold prongs clipped to her eye teeth. So there's our vocab word again, minute. When I admired them and hoped I would have some eventually, she said, Look here. With a click of her tongue, she thrust out her bridge work, a gesture of cordiality that cemented our friendship. So uh, if you're unfamiliar with that term, she's taken out her dentures. Miss Maudie's benevolence extended to Jim and Dill, wherever they paused in their pursuit. So we can look at benevolence, and without even looking up the word, we can tie it back to our previous vocab word, uh, benign. So bene, if you don't know, comes from the Latin for good. So benefit, benevolence, all those. So we can kind of tie those together using our knowledge. 
We reaped the benefits of a talent Miss Maudie had hitherto kept hidden from us. She made the best cakes in the neighborhood. When she was admitted into our confidence, every time she baked, she made a big cake and three little ones, as she would call across the street, Jim Finch, Scout Finch, Charles Baker Harris, come here. Our promptness was always rewarded. In summertime, twilights are long and peaceful. Often as not, Miss Maudie and I would sit silently on our porch, watching the sky go from yellow to pink as the sun went down, watching flights of martins sweep low over the neighborhood and disappear behind the schoolhouse rooftops. Miss Maudie, I said one afternoon, do you think Boo Radley's still alive? His name is Arthur and he's alive, she said. She was rocking slowly in her big oak chair. Do you smell my mimosa? It's like angel's breath this evening. Yes, um, how do you know? Know what, child? That the Mr. Arthur's still alive. What a morbid question. But I suppose it's a morbid subject. I know he's alive, Jean Louise, because I haven't seen him carried out yet. Well, maybe he died and they stuffed him up the chimney. Where did you get such a notion? That's what Jim said he thought they did. <laughs> He gets more like Jack Finch every day. Miss Maudie had known Uncle Jack Finch, Atticus's brother, since they were children. Nearly the same age, they had grown up together at Finch's Landing. Miss Maudie was the daughter of a neighboring landover, Dr. Frank Buford. Dr. Buford's profession was medicine, and his obsession was anything that grew in the ground, so he stayed poor. Uncle Jack Finch confined his passion for digging to his window boxes in Nashville and stayed rich. We saw Uncle Jack every Christmas, and every Christmas he yelled across the street for Miss Maudie to come marry him. Miss Maudie would yell back, Call back a little louder, Jack Finch, and they'll hear you at the post office. I haven't heard you yet. Jim and I thought this a strange way to ask for a lady's hand in marriage, but then Uncle Jack was rather strange. He said he was trying to get Miss Maudie's goat, and that he'd been trying unsuccessfully for 40 years, that he was the last person in the world Miss Maudie would think about marrying, but the first person she thought about teasing. The best defense to her was a spirited offense, all of which we understood clearly. Okay, so let's pause here real quick. Let's add these into the notes. So it's not a key event. It's more of something that we just want to make sure that we know. So we want to add in Miss Ma Audie is the neighbor, and Scout is developing. Hey, so this is important because in the story there, when we go back and look at the idea of gender roles, there's a lot of different ways to view what's happening. And what's going on with Miss Maudie kind of demonstrates to Scout that there is a different way that women can behave without being necessarily ostracized from polite society, without going the full direction of some of the women that we'll meet later. Arthur Radley just stays in that house, that's all, said Miss Maudie. Wouldn't you stay in the house if you didn't want to come out? Yes, but I'd want to come out. Why doesn't he? Miss Maudie's eyes narrowed. You know that story as well as I do. I never heard why, though. Nobody ever told me why. Miss Maudie settled her bridge work. You know old Mr. Radley was a foot-washing Baptist. That's what you are, ain't it? My shell's not that hard, child. I'm just a Baptist. Don't y'all believe in foot-washing? We do, at home in the bathtub. But we can't have communion with y'all. Apparently deciding it was easier to define primitive baptistry than closed communion, Ms. Maudie said, Foot washers believe anything that's a pleasure is a sin. Did you know that some of them came out of woods one Saturday and passed by this place and told me me and my flowers were going to hell? Your flowers too? Yes, ma'am. They burn right with me. They thought I spent too much time in God's outdoors and not enough time inside the house reading the Bible. My confidence in pulpit gospel lessened at the vision of Miss Maudie stewing forever in various Protestant hells. True enough, she had an acid tongue in her head, and she did not go about the neighborhood doing good work, as did Miss Stephanie Crawford. But while no one with a grade of sense trusted Miss Stephanie, Jim and I had considerable faith in Miss Maudie. She had never told on us, had never played cat and mouse with us. She was not at all interested in our private lives. She was our friend. How so reasonable a creature could live in peril of everlasting torment was incomprehensible. That ain't right, Miss Maudie. You're the best lady I know. 
Ms. Marty grinned. Thank you, ma'am. Thing is, foot washers think women are a sin by definition. They take the Bible literally, you know. Is that why Mr. Arthur stays away from the house to keep away from women? I have no idea. It doesn't make sense to me. Looks like if Mr. Arthur was hankering after heaven, he'd come out on the porch at least. Atticus says God's loving folks like you love yourself. Miss Maudie stopped rocking and her voice hardened. You are too young to understand it, she said. But sometimes the Bible in the hand of one man is worse than a whiskey bottle in the hand of, of your father. I was shocked. Atticus doesn't drink whiskey, I said. He never drank a drop in his life. No, I yes, he did. He said he drank some one time, and he, he didn't like it. Miss Maudie laughed. Wasn't talking about your father, he said. What I meant was, if Atticus Finch drank until he was drunk, he wouldn't be so hard as some men are at their best. There's just some kind of men who, who are so busy worrying about the next world that they never learn to live in this one, and you can look down the street and see the results. So there we go. We've learned a little bit more about the Radley family, why they don't come out and why they don't build relationships with their neighbors. So let's add this in. So the, the Radleys are devoutly religious and strict. So they don't have time for going out and talking to their neighbors or anything of the sort. Everybody's a sinner for them and they want to stay away from them. Do you think they're all true, all those things they say about Mr. Arthur? What things? I told her. That is three-fourths color folk and one-fourth Stephanie Crawford, said Miss Maudie grimly. Stephanie Crawford even told me once she woke up in the middle of the night and found him looking in the window at her. I said, what did you do, Stephanie? Move over there in bed and make room for him? That shut her up a while. I was sure it did. Miss Maudie's voice was enough to shut anybody up. No, child, she said. That is a sad house. I remember Arthur Radley when he was a boy. He always spoke nicely to me, no matter what folks said he did. Spoke as nicely as he knew how. You reckon he's crazy? Miss Maudie shook her head. If he's not, he should be by now. The things that happen to people, we never really know. What happens in houses behind closed doors? What secrets? Atticus don't ever do anything to Jim and me in the house that he don't do in the yard. I said, feeling it was my duty to defend my parent. Gracious child, I was reveling a thread, wasn't even thinking about your father. But now that I am, I will say this, Atticus Finch is the same in his house as he is on the public streets. How'd you like some fresh pancake to take home? I liked it very much. So... So rumor says that the Radleys are very harsh inside their home. So that may explain, they may not be crazy, but they're still not the kind of people that are particularly friendly to the outside. Next morning when I awakened, I found Jim and Dill in the backyard deep in conversation. When I joined them as usual, they said, go away. Well, not this yard's as much mine as it is yours, Jim Finch. I got as much right to play in it as you have. Dill and Jim emerged from a brief huddle. If you stay, you've got to do what we tell you, Dill warned. Well, I said, who's so high and mighty all of a sudden? If you don't say you'll do what we tell you, we ain't going to tell you anything, Dill continued. You act like you grew ten inches in a night. All right, what is it? Jim said placidly, we are going to give a note to Boo Radley. Just how? I was trying to fight down the automatic terror rising in me. It was all right for Miss Maudie to talk. She was old and snug on her porch. It was different for us. Ah, so here we have our important key event in the story coming up here. So, kids decide to try to meet Boo Radley. Jim was merely going to put a note on the end of a fishing pole and stick it through the shutters. If anyone came along, Dill would ring the bell. Dill raised his right hand, and it was my mother's silver dinner bell. I'm going around to the side of the house, said Jim. We looked yesterday from across the street, and there's a shutter loose. I think maybe I can make it stick on the windowsill at least. Jim, 
Now you're in it and you can't get out of it. You'll just stay in it, Miss Pris. Okay, okay, but I don't want to watch, Jim. Somebody was... Yes, you will. You'll watch the back end of the lot, and Dill's going to watch the front of the house and up the street, and if anybody comes along, he'll ring the bell. That clear? All right, then. What'd you write him? Dill said. We're asking him real politely to come out sometime and tell us what he does in there. We said we wouldn't hurt him, and we'd buy him an ice cream. You've all gone crazy. He'll kill us all. Dill said. It's my idea. I figured if he'd come out and sit a spell with us, he might feel better. How do you know he don't feel good? Well, how'd you feel if you was shut up for a hundred years with nothing but cats to eat? I bet he's got a beard down to here. Like your daddy's? He ain't got a beard. He Dill stopped as if trying to remember. Uh-huh. Gotcha, I said. You said before you were off the train good. Your daddy had a black beard. If it's all the same to you, he shaved it off last summer. Yeah, and I've got the letter to prove it. He sent me two dollars, too. Keep on. I reckon he even sent you a mounted police uniform. And that never showed up, did it? You just keep on telling him, son. Dill Harris could tell the biggest ones I ever heard. Among other things, he'd been up in a mail plane 17 times. He had been to Nova Scotia. He had seen an elephant, and his granddaddy was Brigadier General Joe Wheeler and left him his sword. You will hush, said Jim. He scuttled beneath the house and came out with a yellow bamboo pole. Reckon this is long enough to reach from the sidewalk? Anybody who's brave enough to go up to the house ain't ought to use a fishing pole, I said. Why don't you just knock the front door down? This is different, said Jim. How many times do I have to tell you that? Dill took a piece of paper from his pocket and gave it to Jim. The three of us walked cautiously towards the old house. Dill remained at the light pole on the front corner of the lot, and Jim and I edged down the sidewalk parallel to the side of the house. I walked beyond Jim and stood where I could see around the curve. All clear, I said, not a soul in sight. Jim looked up from the sidewalk to Dill, who nodded. Jim attached the note to the end of the fishing pole, let the pole out across the yard, and pushed it towards the window he had selected. The pole lacked several inches of being long enough, and Jim leaned over as far as he could. I watched him making jabbing motions for so long I abandoned my post and went to him. Can't get it off a pole, he muttered. Or if I got it off, I can't make it stay. Going back down the street, Scout. I returned and gazed around to the curve at the empty road. Occasionally, I looked back at Jim, who was patiently trying to place the note on the windowsill. It would flutter to the ground and Jim would jab it up, until I thought if Boo Radley ever received it, he wouldn't be able to read it. I was looking down the street when the dinner bell rang. Shoulder up, I reeled around to face Boo Radley and his bloody fangs. Instead, I saw Dill ringing the bell with all his might in Atticus's face. Jim looked so awful I didn't have the heart to tell him I told him so. He trudged along, dragging the pole behind him on the sidewalk. Atticus said, Stop ringing that bell. Dill grabbed the clapper. In the silence that followed, I wished he'd start ringing it again. Atticus pushed his hat to the back of his head and put his hands on his hips. Jim, he said, what were you doing? Nothing, sir. I don't want any of that. Tell me. I was, uh, we were just trying to give something to Mr. Radley. What were you trying to give him? Just a letter. Let me see it. Jim held out a filthy piece of paper. Atticus took it and tried to read it. Why do you want Mr. Radley to come out? Dill said, we thought he might enjoy us, and dried up when Atticus looked at him. Son, he said to Jim, I'm going to tell you something and tell you one time. Stop tormenting that man. That goes for the other two of you. What Mr. Radley did was his own business. If he wanted to come out, he would. If he wanted to stay inside his house, he had the right to stay inside, free from the attentions of inquisitive children, which was a mild term for the likes of us. So we haven't gotten a whole lot of vocab for this chapter, so let's throw that one in there as well. Inquisitive. Curious or inquiring. So unduly curious about the affairs of others. Full of questions. All right, we're at it. Let's add this as well. Catches. Kids trying to put 
note into the Hadley house tells them to stop. All right. How would we like it if Atticus barged in on us without knocking when we were in our rooms at night? We were, in effect, doing the same thing to Mr. Radley. What Mr. Radley did might seem peculiar to us, but it did not seem peculiar to him. Furthermore, had it never occurred to us that the civil way to communicate with another being was by the front door instead of the side window? Lastly, we were to stay away from that house until we were invited there. We were not to play an asinine game he had seen us playing or make fun of anybody on this street or in this town. I'm extremely stupid or foolish. We weren't making fun of him. We weren't laughing at him, said Jim. We were just... So that was what you were doing, wasn't it? Making fun of him? No, said Atticus, putting his life's history on display for the edification of the neighborhood. Jim seemed to swell a little. I didn't say we were doing that. I didn't say it. Atticus grinned dryly. You just told me, he said. You stop this nonsense right now. Every one of you. Jim gaped at him. You want to be a lawyer, don't you? Our father's mouth was suspiciously firm, as if he were trying to hold it in line. Jim decided there was no point in quibbling and was silent. When Atticus went inside the house to retrieve a file he had forgotten to take to work that morning, Jim finally realized that he had been done in by the oldest lawyer's trick on record. He waited a respectful distance from the front steps, watched Atticus leave the house and walk toward town. When Atticus was out of earshot, Jim yelled at him, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but I ain't so sure now.